Hello, thanks for coming. My name is Jay Smith. I'm, um, uh, for those of you who've been here before, I am based in London, England, and have spent uh, most of my time, certainly the last 12 years, living in London and uh, doing a ministry there that's rather unique. I don't think it's done anywhere else in the world because there's no place like Speaker's Corner anywhere else in the world. And uh, we have put together a workshop there. We put together a team of individuals every Sunday who go down as a group, 30 or 40 of us, and we get up on ladders, we stay on the ground, we, and we take on the Muslims. And there's hundreds, sometimes thousands of Muslims there on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it's the only place on earth that you can really do this. Primarily because in London we have such a draconian gun laws that um, there's no way we can be shot to pieces like uh, we would if we try to do it in America, for instance, at Santa Monica or Washington Square. The kind of material that we're using at Speaker's Corner uh, is unique. And we're using an awful lot of new uh, historical material that's exciting that we can only use at Speaker's Corner. And we have found that that place is a great laboratory to learn how to not only take on the challenges of Islam, but to respond to them and to then take those same challenges and put them right back on the laps of the Muslims. Uh, and we'll do and go through some of those today. It's um, not only is it, a, it's, is it a laboratory, but it's a tr terrific training ground for people before they go out into the Muslim world. We have found that many of the challenges, oh, in fact, almost every one of the challenges you're going to get hit with, whether you're in Kazakhstan or whether you're in Morocco or Saudi Arabia, regardless of where you're going to find yourself, every question that you, get, that you will get will probably be asked you at some time or another at Speaker's Corner. And uh, you can be down there uh, on an afternoon uh, in a two or three hour period, you can be talking to six, seven different people from seven different countries. The whole world comes to London. It's an exciting place. We have a million Muslims living in London, uh, and that sometimes doubles during the summertime. So it's a ten, almost a tenth of our population is Islamic in London. Because of that, it's, it's ideal. It's terrific. And the great thing about Speaker's Corner, it's been around for 130 years. And it's an institution, it's a British institution, uniquely an English institution, where you can get up and say anything you want. Now, there are two rules. You must not uh, take the name of the Lord in vain. You must not slag off the Queen, I'm sorry. And you must not use any violence. Now, those are broken almost every day down there. But we do have policemen to try to keep it under control. And they do a very good job. And uh, we just found out just how, uh, just how much they support what we're doing. Two weeks ago, I had a wallet stolen. And uh, I went to report it to the police. And the police, who was in charge of all the others there, said, can you get in the van? I want to talk to you. So I got in the van with him. And this is just two weeks ago. And he said, um, he said, we just want to let you know, while he was writing up the report, he just turned to me, looked both ways, he says, listen, I'm going to talk as a private citizen, not as a policeman. Just want to let you know that what you're doing is brilliant. We are so, we are very proud of what you're doing. And I, he, he explained, a few, uh, two months ago, I was uh, attacked and I, I got bloody. There's, there's a scar uh, from some Muslims that tried to push me down a stairway there, just off, the, just off Speaker's Corner. And he was the one that had written up the report for that. And afterwards, I got back up again. And then whenever we get punched or if we get hit or if we get um, attacked, we just get right back up on the ladder and just keep going. Because we find that's probably the best testimony. We find also it really cools the crowd right down. They quiet right down and they listen to what you're saying. And he was very impressed with the fact that we just got right back up on the ladder and would not even mention it, just continue on as if nothing had happened. And he says, that's exactly what speakers call Not that you're supposed to have violence, but that it's supposed to be a place for debate. It's supposed to be a place with an exchange of words, not an exchange of fists. And they're very glad we're there because we're the only ones that are doing that to the Muslims. And he just wanted to let me know. So even the police are behind us. And it's terrific to have had that word of encouragement as a private citizen rather than as an official police. But one of the things we have found is that people that come down to Speaker's Corner, after they're about a year or two, they learn their theology probably faster and better than anybody going to Bible school. And it's, it stands to reason because you learn it in praxis. And one of the th other problems is that people who have come out of a Bible school in environment usually tend to know the theory but do not know actually how to apply it. And the tendency is, I think we as Christians, is we're not very good at not only defining what we believe but defending it publicly. Muslims are brilliant at public uh, apologetics and also polemics. They're very public. As you well know, those of you who work with Muslims know very well that Muslims are always very public. The way they pray is public. The way they respond, in a, and certainly the way they communicate is very public. We're not. 
And so a place like Speaker's Corner or even on a university campus doing meetings there is ideal to learn and do just that. So what we're going to do today, and I've been asked, to, uh, uh, I've been asked by um, Dr. Greg Pritchard to help you out with some of the methodologies, some of the things. Yeah, go ahead. There's a handout there if you don't have any. Some of the methodologies that we have found to be the most adequate. We have found some of the strategies that we have found that work or do not work. Uh, to try to help you with those, and then we're going to get you and actually get into some of the questions, some of the most often asked questions, and then let you throw questions out. I've got Andy here. Andy Bannister is uh, from London School of Theology, London Bible, formerly known as London Bible College. We're both doing doctorates there. So Andy ha I've known for a number of years, and Andy is another one of the what we call a ladderman. A ladderman is a person who actually gets up on a ladder, uh, and you have to earn your right to be a ladderman, don't you, Andy? The hard way. And the way to learn to, earn a, uh, to be a ladderman, you have to be able to have won three debates down at Speaker's Corner or have held a crowd of 100 for at least 45 minutes. And Andy's done that many times. And he comes down often, and usually Andy and I will get on two different ladders and we'll just play with the crowd. And we'll just uh, use each other as foils. And we'll take on whatever the subject is of the, of the day. The last time Andy was down, we actually proved that Winnie the Pooh was a Muslim. And we had a great time with the Muslims on that one, using some of their paradigms and trying to tr understand how they make Jesus a Muslim. We applied the same, the same, uh, I, the same, basically the same strategies or the same scenario, and we applied it to Winnie the Pooh. And we created Winnie the Pooh as a Muslim using the same criteria. It was obviously the, the crowd understood where we were going with it. And it's terrific to be able to do that. Now, first and foremost, if you just open up to page five, I'm going to go backwards on this. I'm going to look at the methodology first. It says, does yours say methodology at the top? Should be point C. Is that what you have on your, at the top of yours? Okay. There is a, that, uh, that little line underneath is, is really our, our uh, I guess you might say that's, that's, that is our rallying cry. Uh, it comes from a picture that I saw in a friend's house, a picture of a little boat that was off in the, yeah, in the middle of a painting, and the little boat was in the middle of the ocean, and there was huge dark clouds above it, ready to, de ready to ha a huge storm was about ready to descend on that little boat, and there was waves lapping on all sides, and you could see what was about ready to hit that boat. But off in the little far lower left-hand corner of the picture, you can see in the distance was a beautiful harbor, an idyllic harbor, sunny harbor, and there was a retaining wall, and inside that retaining wall were about seven or six boats, Quite a contrast to what you see in the middle of the picture. And this caption was underneath, and it said, A boat in the harbor is safe, but that is not what boats are made for. And that's the caption we use, and that's really the, our, uh, the dictum that we follow there at Speaker's Corner, at the workshop, or those of us who are working in a more radical environment. It is safe to be amongst our own friends and never really have to go out and deal with Muslims, but that's not what we're made for. And I think most of you would agree with that. Uh, certainly, that would be also a great caption for this, this, this conference. We're not made to stay in the churches amongst our own friends, amongst people of our own kind. We need to get out to where, where the, the war is and the battle is. And in many respects right now, the battle, since, certainly since 9 is with Islam. Now, let's go down and let's just look at some of the, some of the paradigms that we use. We're going to start, jump over the first uh, sections and just look at the public evangelism in the West. These are ones that we have found to be very helpful with public meetings, door-to-door, -door, speaker's corner, book tables. Whatever type of uh, methodology you use, whatever type of strategy you use, you can use any of these for that, for those categories. The first one is it's, we need to be very public. One of the reasons why we go to speaker's corner is to learn how to define what we believe and to defend it and then reverse the promise, promise challenge and put it right back on the laps of the Muslims. So when they attack us about the authority of our scriptures, we'll defend it. And we'll define it, and we'll try to do that in a two-minute soundbite, but then we'll take the same question and throw it right back in their lap. We find by doing this, you're not only doing a comparative, but you're elevating your scriptures, and then you're demanding that they do the same thing. And by virtue of the fact that they have given the challenge, we have all the right to return that challenge. And we'll still, so show you how we can do that later on. Places like Speaker's Corner, or even when you go on door-to-door, -door, or if you put book tables up, I don't know if any of you had the chance to do that. We like to put book tables up in front of railway stations, tube stops, high streets, wherever there are large numbers of Muslims in their communities. We put book tables up, and that's a great way for them to get engaged in the dis discussion. Books that have to do with Islam. Obviously, they'll see the titles, and they'll start questioning about what the titles are. And then you can take them aside, and you can get into some great exchanges. And usually, if it's a good discussion, a group will form very quickly. 
and we find that those can be can go on for about an hour or two. There's a terrific way to, it's cold evangelism, it's very difficult and you have to be quick on your feet, but we find it's a great way because to engage with them because you're on their territory. You're in their neighborhood, in their environment. And it's not in your face in that you're not at the mosque or you're not uh, at their local um, tea shop, but you're in close enough that they feel comfortable. And of course, there's many of them there, and it's a great way to at least engage with them and also make a presence in their environment. It may be hostile at times, that's true. Often very public, and it's great that uh, Muslims are very public. Well, I don't have, well, we've never really had a problem trying to get them to engage. You don't really have to dangle a carrot in front of them to get them to talk about what they believe. We found that one of the best ways is just to open up and say, do you realize that I believe the Bible is the word of God? Or that, yes, I do believe that Jesus was the son of God. They're going to have a reaction to that. Most Muslims, even the most nominal, if they don't have a reaction, usually uh, one of the things we can do is that we just go on to the next subject. Or let them say, does that bother you? Does, uh, are you aware that certainly we have a disengagement? Or, or bring up something that's in the news. Talk about, the, uh, we've been talking about the movie called The Passion. And of course a lot of Muslims have been going to. And we've been asking them, what is their opinion of that? Have they gone? Does that bother them? Does that upset them? What about what the Quran says about Jesus on the cross? And immediately you engage in something that's, that's uh, current. Or talk about the Iraqi war. As an American, I always get a reaction on that one. And of course, they want to know, what, as an American, as a Christian, how can I s support what Bush is doing? And it's been terrific for me to be able to set, set, correct the record and say there's an awful lot of Americans that do not support that war. There's an awful lot of Americans that certainly, though Bush claims to be a Christian, many of us who are Christians have a difficulty with the way he's, with the choices he's made. And of course, you can get, immediately get into a, something that's topical that will then move on and say, now, what is it about the war that bothers you? Tell me, as a Muslim, what is it about warfare? Do, can you, is warfare correct in Islam? Do you really believe that you're a religion of peace? Because I hear that claim. Do you believe you're a religion of tolerance? Let's talk about it. Let's see which scripture actually talks about peace and tolerance. Let me, if you let me open up my scripture, and immediately you've got, you engage it with them on that topic. It's topical. It's in the news. They want to find out about it. They don't know who to go to. Suddenly, you're in their territory, and you're opening up a topic that they are engaged with. It's a great place to learn your apologetics. Muslims are terrific. As I said upstairs uh, in the last session with David Cook, I just love Muslims because they are so passionate. Most of them are, and I've never heard, never met them, uh, people that are more passionate for what they believe. I get, I get tired of English students on university campuses who don't want to talk about their faith or even believe, bring up any idea of faith. But you don't have that problem with most Muslims. I'm not going to say all Muslims. Some Muslims don't want to talk about faith, obviously. But the majority of the ones that I've come across do, once they feel comfortable, once they realize that you are a man of faith. By virtue of that means that you're willing to say something publicly about what you believe. And... Because of that, in some ways, we see them as being aggressive. I don't consider them to be aggressive. Andy, do you consider them aggressive? Certainly. Okay, what would you define it as? I would define it as passionate, spirited, and um, also a reflection of Arabic culture very often, which we mistake as aggression. Arabic culture and Asian culture as well, because the majority we get in England tend to come from Asia. But you're right, it is very cultural. And it's one of the ironies that we try to contextualize the gospel and many of the models for contextualization in missiology for Islam tend to be ironic models, means of models of friendship based on European ideas of what it means to be a friend. And it's fascinating that one of the best ways to be, we have found to be a friend to a Muslim is to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. They love it because that's what they do. And if you want to be really contextual, confront them with what they're saying. And be open to be confronted and don't run hightail feeling that you have suddenly done a disservice to the gospel. Real contextualization actually goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and is just as passionate as they are. And uh, I remember when we were at, uh, I remember the story. I'm sorry, can I just Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, I mean, stand close to them so your toes are almost touching. So you're right face-to-face, face-to-face, toe-to-toe, face-to-face. But toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I think, is actually a bo boxing term, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Help me here. It's an idiomatic expression that we use. You actually, you, you go blow for blow, blow for blow. In other words, you give as much as you take. For them, that, that creates a huge amount of respect on their part. Go ahead. Is there a point at which you make them very angry? So okay. You need to be very careful. You don't want to do that. Yeah. Could you do that and make it possible to step over We're, the line where you insult their religion rather than just argue? 
Good point. And Roger's brought a very good point. And one of the problems, one of the things we fall into more often than that is we use a character assassination more than doing something that's blasphemous. Uh, when I say Jesus is Lord and that he died on the cross, that is going to get them angry because that is blasphemous. And I'm willing to say that, and I will say that, but they, may, they would expect me to say that. Right. They know well enough that that's exactly where I stand. I'd be care I would never use that. There's no reason to use that. No. And that's why I know some missionaries do that. And I think you need to be very careful about using something that is not only as injurious as that, but certainly there's no reason. We, I don't believe he was a pedophile, as we define pedophilia. Now, I will say, and I have done this many times, when they, when they make the claim, and one of the things we always do is let them make the claims first about who their prophet is. And then I will say, if you believe, and one of the first claims they will make on that score is, he is a universal paradigm for us for all times and all places. I say, if he's a universal paradigm, I have some difficulties. Let me just give you a few. What he did with the Jews in Medina is a difficult for me because that paradigm, what he did to those Jews is if I was a Jew or if I was a Christian living under that jurisdiction, I would be not only uh, would I would be threatened, but it would certainly be, it would be almost on the par of genocide. And I might even use that word genocide, what he did to the Jews. And if he's your paradigm today, are you going to do the same thing to me if I'm in your juris under your jurisdiction? Or what he did to Aisha, if he married this girl when she was nine years old and he was 53, consummated the marriage, actually married her when she was seven, but he consummated it when she was a nine-year-old little girl playing with dolls out on the swing and was called in to go into that room so that he could consummate the marriage. She didn't even know where she was going into. Now, is that, an, is that, per, is that a universal model for today? I would like to know. I won't give a name to it. I won't say that's pedophilia because I don't believe that is pedophilia. He married her. He didn't force it upon her. It was a contract between him mother, her mother and him. But certainly, that's not a model for us today. We don't do that today. And if that's not a model, then are, then are you willing to condemn it for today and say that Muhammad is not a paradigm for today in certain areas? And that's as far as I'll go with that. But that's perfectly legitimate for, for, to ask those kind of questions. You're expressing it from, I, I have a concern or a problem with this. That's how you just expressed it. I'm actually challenging his statement of yeah. universality. Yeah. And I will take the challenge to him. Now, I, I will, even sometimes I will be, depending on who's standing in front of me, and I guess you need to be careful because obviously depending on the culture of the person, if you're going to be too meek and mild, you're not going to be very convincing. Sometimes you'll have to come just lean forward and talking about toe-to-toe, -to -toe, you better be touching his toe-to-toe -to -toe because you will make a much more a larger impact. Uh, we do that sometimes, especially on the context of the authority of Scripture. Many times they will say, and almost every time, whenever you get into a discussion with a Muslim, first and foremost, if you, claim, if you quote from your scriptures, they'll say, I don't want to listen to it. It is corrupted. That's one of the first things you get hit with, the corruption of our scriptures. Now, what we do immediately, uh, depending if it's a person is castigating my scriptures or if he's very aggressive, I'll say, hold on a minute. Let's don't go any further. Stop what you're doing. Don't you ever say that to me unless you can support it. Can you support it right now, sir? If you said my scriptures are corrupt, can you support it? Let me help, help you out. Was it corrupted before or after Muhammad? Was it corrupted before the Quran was written or after the Quran? Then you just ask me that part. Can you tell me when and where it was corrupted? Can you answer me those two questions? Now, they won't be able to. Some will, but rarely will you find someone that will. And if they cannot, if the person has been very aggressive to begin with, I'll say, now, I want you to apologize for what you've just said. You've injured me by saying something like that. Do you realize, don't you ever say that in my presence. Please don't say that in my presence again. Because I know my scriptures are not corrupted. Now, what does that do to my scriptures? It elevates my Bible to where it belongs. And it's the way I said it will be almost as convincing as what I've said. But you're using a, cult, a paradigm of, of honoring of scripture that, that is a Muslim. Exactly. The they speak about their scripture. They would, do the exact, they would demand the exact same thing to me in return. Now, I'll do that with an Arab before I'll do that with an Asian. For the Asians, no, I'm a little more careful because of their, for them it's not that important that I am as forceful. But with the Arabs, you've got to be just as forceful right back. And you have to be just as black and white, no grays. You've got to be just as, uh, as, as convincing of them. And the great thing about a place like Speaker's Corner is you get Arabs and Asians all the time. So we have to, uh, to fine-tune it depending on who's standing in front of you. And you're going to find the same thing in Europe. You will find many types of Muslims in Italy. There are not just Moroccans. There's probably also some Senegalese. There's probably also some Algerians and some Arabs. And you're going to have to fine-tune it depending on who's standing in front of you. I can't say this is the paradigm that you can use all over the world. But certainly you will be able to know what they can take, what they can't take. And a lot of the ways, just look and see how they act towards you. 
how they either attack or challenge your scriptures, or they attack or challenge your, your Lord Jesus Christ. On those two areas, we are very for, forceful. When it, when it ever comes against uh, slagging off our Lord Jesus Christ, um, slagging off, what's a good, such a good word in the British English? Maligning, okay, or, conf or yeah, maligning. If, so I should be careful about the slang that I use. But maligning the Lord Jesus Christ or attacking our scriptures. On those two areas, we get very co confrontive. For very good reasons, because we want to make sure that they don't do this a second time. And it's amazing how that, uh, how that impacts on the crowd that's listening. It's great to be able to do that, because I don't think Christians do it enough. I think it's so important that we show that we do love our Lord Jesus Christ, and we show that we honor our scriptures, and that we need to elevate it where it belongs. Now, we're kind of jumping around here, but let's just go down and continue, continue on down. One of the nice things about living in Europe, one of the great things about those of you who are, um, if you're planning to go on to other Muslim countries afterwards, or if you're going to do your work here, you can make your mistakes here. That's one of the terrific things. You can make your mistakes and you can get away with it. One of the things we tell people at Speaker's Corner, for heaven's sakes, make your mistakes, but don't do it twice. And usually you won't have to, because if you do make a mistake, if you do say something that shouldn't have been said, they will yell al Akbar in your face. And you can remember the face of the person. You might even remember what it smelled like on the day of that question. You got it wrong. And they are so good because they will not let you get away with it if you do make a mistake. That's what I love about them, because they are so quick. And I can't think of a better way to learn your apologetics. But in practice with Muslims, they're terrific people. Now, they were not, even if you say, oh, I'm sorry, I did make the mistake, I did not mean that, uh, you're right, it wasn't that it, all of Scripture is, is uh, sometimes we make mistakes like we'll say, well, every word is, is inspired, and they'll start throwing all kinds of, uh, of, of contradictions in the Scripture. What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about that? Okay, it is the autographs, the original autographs are inspired, but even there, still, we don't have them, therefore there's all kinds of possibilities. Be careful, obviously they're going to try to th get you off your guard. Now, you all make those mistakes. I said one time, accidentally, um, you worship the Quran. I should have never said that. Boy, did they yell at me and holler at me. And I had to just sit and wait there and while, till it all subsided. They said, listen, I stand corrected. I am a human. That shows my finiteness. Let me rephrase that. And you can do that. You make a joke of yourself. Make yourself look foolish. They will laugh, and then you move on, and you've made, you've made your mistake. You don't make it a second time. The great thing about it, you can make your mistakes here in Europe. You can make your mistakes on the streets. And the great thing is, if you do not know the answer, our favorite, our favorite phrase is, give me a week. Give me a week, and I'll come back next week with it. Now, that does two things. You're now, you're gonna, you know now, you're gonna, you've now, basically, you've opened up a chance to see the person the next week. But then you do have a whole week to go back to your commentaries, get up on the Internet, go to answeringislam.org. Every question is up that it's answered is answered up there, it's answeringislam.org or debate.org.uk. Those are the two big websites you can look at. Everything you'll find will be answered on those questions. Or go to your minister or just go to yourself and go back and remember, think a little more clearly so that next week you will have the answer. And then, of course, once you have learned that, you won't have that problem again the third or fourth time. You will have had it under your belt. I, that's one of the great things about living in New York. We can, it is a laboratory here, and I think we need to be careful that we don't have all the answers initially. We won't know their agenda right off the top. Simply learn from them, then get back up on the horse and try again, is what I always tell my students. Don't let it disfloor you if you don't have an answer or if you said the wrong thing. We are just sojourners here, so you won't be held accountable for our mistakes. And if you can find a place, those of you from England or near London, come to a place like Speaker's Corner because it's such a great laboratory to learn your apologetics quickly, and yet, confidently and comprehensively, because you won't get any question anywhere else that you haven't had hit in a place like that. I don't know what you can do in Italy or the other countries you're in, but certainly if there are places that are similar to that, book tables are the other next best thing. We have found book tables are, are, are become, can become very similar to Speaker's Corner, because you'll get into quick... You'll get into lots of discussions. If you use a book table there permanently, if you come back, say, once a week at the same place, Muslims will wait for you. They'll be there waiting for you, and they'll come, and they'll actually bring their imams with them, and you'll have great discussions right there, and it becomes, it'll soon become a place for discussion. At Operation Mobilization Turning Point, we have one at Edgware Road, right in the Arab Quarter there in London. It's become so popular that we've now served coffee there because they all come. They, we, they just know that they're going to appear, and they bring their imams with them, and you create relationships that way very quickly. It's a great venue. You can do the same thing in your own, in your own locales, in your own venues. Remember that Islam is not monolithic. 
Muslims are, make up a great mosaic. I think this is a, a great misnomer. We think that all Muslims talk with one voice. What is good for Abdul may not be good for Ahmed. And it depends on the culture of the person standing in front of you. By virtue of the fact that we're all living in Europe, you're going to have Muslims from many different cultures. In India, we have, I'm sorry, in England, we have, tend to have the majority of Muslims come from the Indian subcontinent. About 70% of all our Muslims come from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, I've been to, you, in Italy, it's what, Moroccans primarily, Tunisians. Where, what other countries do we represent here? And what kind of Muslims would you have there? Oh. Turks? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, I'm here in Britain now only because uh, it is becoming to be an issue in our country right now that freedom has not uh, many Muslims. Ah, so you're getting well prepared for when it happens. Good man. What about yourself? India. Ah, Hindustan log. Yeah, Zai Jai Hind Zindabad, huh? Okay, and also Indian. I mean, that's the third largest Muslim country in the world is India. Of 120 million Muslims in your own country. So they're right next door. Total population, 11%. 11% out of a population of almost a billion. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's about 120 million. That's a lot, lot of Muslims. Look at that. Now, you ha uh, what part of India are you from? Where in North India? Near Bombay. Ah, Bombay, Mumbai. Okay, so Gujaratis, all those. Now, again, have you had contact with Muslims? Do you get many con do you, in your work? Not much, except, you know, I'm teaching in a Bible seminary. Any student who is converted from Islam background will come. Okay. Only hardly one or two. Right? Terrific. Great. But some of our students do work. India is one of the few places where you can have open debates. Dr. Naik is one man who wants to debate me. I'm going to debate him sometime and go to India. He's an enormously competent Muslim debater, and I'm scared to debate him because I know he's going to run circles around me. But we've got the better material. He's the better debater, and we can have William Craig teach us how to do better debating. We'll have both down, hand, hands down. But we're going to come to India and do some debates there. So we'll see you there when we get there. But certainly there it would be Pakistanis, but it would be also the indigenous, your Gujaratis, and also your Rajasthani Muslims. So you have them all around you. What other country do we have represented besides England and? Okay, now what kind of Muslims would you have there? All right, similar to Italy, also similar to Germany. Again, now what rule of thumb? Let me just give you a rule of thumb of what we have found because we get all of these at Speaker's Corner. You're, the, the, if you're looking at a Muslim standing in front of you and you try to find out what country they're from right away, it may be easier if, you're already, if you already know what, what they are by virtue of the fact that they are the majority in, the, in your country. If they're a Turk, we find with most Turks, they don't know their Islam at all. They know very little about Islam. In fact, you'll have to probably teach them what they're to, say, what they're to know. You will find yourself defining for them or asking them to source what they're saying because they'll make up things as they go along. And we're always saying, can you source that in the Quran? Well, no, I've never read the Quran. Well, why is it you're saying that then? Well, I've just been told. Are you aware of the fact that your Quran actually says something different? You, you, we find yourself having to do that all the time. If they're Moroccan, uh, they tend to be much more politically uh, imbibed. They don't know much theology. Your Algerians, your Moroccans, your Libyans tend to be a lot more politically imbued, especially your Algerians. Some of the Moroccans will have some bit, uh, theological training. What they will tend to do is they won't know the answer. They'll go back and the next time you see them, the second time, they'll bring the imam from the local mosque or some talibe, some disciple who's learning under imam, which is exciting because when that happens, then you can have a group listening to you. Go to a tea shop there in Italy. You'll find them. I think we talked about it last night. Go to where the court is. Invite yourself to the tea shop outside the mosque and then do what we do at Finsbury Park Mosque. We go to that tea shop and start talking very loudly whenever you talk to them. People will hear what you're saying. They'll want to get involved and they'll, pretty soon you'll have 20 people around you. And though you're talking to the imam in front of you, it's the 20 or 30 people who are listening that you're really targeting. And they'll look at you, they'll look at the imam, and they'll see how you react, and they'll see you smile, and you take them on, and you'll see you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and they'll see for the first time that here's a Christian that not only knows what he believes, but is able to define it and defend it publicly. And that will make a huge credibility, for, give you a huge amount of credibility. It can be difficult initially, but it's, it's so much fun. They're so great to talk to, and, yet, and it's so great to realize that people, for the first time, are hearing the gospel firsthand. Yes, all the time. And I'll, we'll come to that when we get to the questions. Now, what else? So we have Italy, we have Holland, we have uh, 
Uh, Czechoslovakia. So, uh, you have what there? Somalis. Somalis are a different kettle of fish. Uh, Somalis usually do not are not do not know a lot of their theology. Uh, most of them are, I would say, and we don't get too many Somalis that we talk theologically with. And one of the problems is that most of them are refugees. They're just escaping, and their their memories of Islam tend to be very negative. And so usually many of them are quite open to actually talk about, but they will not, once they start getting to theological, they do not and can't seem to get past the prophet in the book, the, the Quran. They just, they, those things will not, you, you cannot touch. You have to be careful when you get to those subjects. When you get to uh, an Asian, I hope some of you do get to Asians, they tend to be the best and the brightest. And the, and when I say Asian, I mean the Indian subcontinent. And the reason is very simple, as our gentleman here can see. They have had British educational system for about 100, 200 years. Therefore, they understand the Western mindset much better than any of the other, um, any of the other Muslims. And that's one reason why it's exciting to be in a place like the United Kingdom, because the best and the brightest are all there. Your best debaters tend to come from the Indian subcontinent. Men like Ahmad Didat in South Africa, or Shabir Ali, or, um, well, Jamal Badawi is actually, is actually Egyptian. Nike, the one that's in India right now. And the best material on the internet, and the best material that we're finding in their journals, especially Dahwa, that which is attacking Christianity, comes out of the Indian subcontinent. The ones that are attacking the Trinity, the fact that you brought that up, that's usually always the first thing that the Asians always hit at us, because they know that's our weakest public defense. It's our weakest area to, uh, to defend publicly. We'll talk about that when we get to that. All right, let's move on down. So it is a mosaic. No, any, not every Muslim is going to be the same. Is going to be need, you're going to need to dovetail it depending on who's standing in front of you. The focus we always say whenever you get into discussion is the audience. It's not necessarily the person in front of you. We get, uh, and do not worry if you do not, win the, if you do not win the argument. You're not really there to win an argument. You're there to, make, to be a representative of Christ Jesus. And what you say and how you say it is very important. But they may, and they will sometimes run circles around you. Don't get flustered. Realize that it's the people on the outside that you're really focusing on. All right? It's the ones listening. As I said, whether it's a tea shop, whether it's a place like Speaker's Corner, whether it's a book table, even when you're on the doorstep or whether it's in a university setting, when you go to one of their meetings, you're going to, have a, you're going to be surrounded real quickly when they find somebody, especially if you're a Westerner who's actually talking about religion. They're going to surround you, and it's big, ex expect it and get excited by it. Don't be intimidated by it. It can be intimidating to begin with. I find that once you do have a crowd, don't just speak to the person to you. Move around and get eye contact with everybody around you and bring them into the discussion. What do you think about what I just said? Now, what do you think about what he just said? I want your opinion now. You tell me, did that might not make sense, what I'm speaking of? Because he'll speak, the person in front of you will probably be slagging you off, but the person outside will not have that same opinion. Get them into the discussion so they're reacting. Or did you hear what we both now, where we talked about Scripture, what he said about Scripture, what I said about Scripture, are you convinced by either he or myself? Use them for, as a foil for your, for your um, conversations. Go ahead. Jake, can I just ask you about follow-up in, in a sort of culture of fear to a certain extent? If there's someone in the crowd who you think, actually, that guy's really interested, um, how do you then follow that person up? Um, because your conversation is with the, with, with the professional in front of you, to use that. Follow it, you mean after the after yeah, discussion? Just go up and do them, do it. I mean, there's no reason why you can't say that. And they should, there should not be fear in this context, not in the European context. You remember, you're in Europe now. We're not in a Muslim context. In a Muslim context, where you're in a Muslim country, you do need to be careful uh, because there is seniority. There is also there, uh, there is a hierarchical system, but not here. That, that wouldn't be threatening to that person. No, should not be. No. In fact, if anything, it will elevate that person in the eyes of the other is the fact that he will answer. And you'll be doing him a service if you bring him into discussion. But you'll be doing mainly yourself a service. When you see someone nodding their head, immediately say, I, I want to talk to you about this. I want you to tell me what you think about what has been said. Or say, do you all agree with this? And if so, can you support it? Tell me why you agree. I want to know. Or you just agree with him because he's the Muslim. You know, you're permitted. You're in, and just say, I sometimes make a joke about it. I say, listen, you're in England now. You can have your own mind here. Tell me exactly what you think. Because certainly I would like, you're just as important to this discussion as the man I'm talking to in front of you. Yeah. Um, but that's very encouraging. 
yeah, that should be a problem here. I've not really had a problem, I've seen certainly in the groups that we've used, okay? Yeah, well, let's just go down to the next page. And one of the things that um, obviously, and maybe this should be at the very beginning, and that is we always, before we go do anything, we have a, a time of prayer. Before we go out to Speaker's Corner, we have either 15 minutes to half an hour of prayer. Just make sure that you have that covering. You need that covering. It's a battle that's being fought both in the heavenlies and on the ground. We have churches over in America and in Canada who, while I get up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock on the ladder, they're praying at 10.30, five hours difference. They're praying at that time that I will say the right thing, that I'll have protection, that the gospel will be preached, and that people will be convinced. So you always have to have that prayer covering. When you go to a mosque, if you're going to go to a mosque, make sure there's two of you. Make sure there's people praying before. Make sure there's people praying while you're there. We always make sure you go in groups of two so that so while one person's speaking, the other person can be praying. And then you can flip. When you run out of ideas, the next person jumps in. It works great. We do this at Speaker's Corner. Try to make sure we're in prayers. The same could, 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 be, uh, could be the case in any one of these, um, um, any one of these um, strategies. Pairs, yeah, I just spoke about that. Rule of thumb, scratch where they itch. Find out what they say first. I, what, what I like to do is I try to find out what, they, what their claims are for the Quran. I want to find out what their claims are for Muhammad. Find out what they say. And once they have made these claims, then you can start engaging with those claims. And you will find that they will make huge claims that they'll, that they'll have to start receding from or they'll have to be start retracting from. Because they will make enormous claims that they don't intend. The Quran is the word of God. It is perfect in every detail. We, we talked about that yesterday in the workshop yesterday. How is it you can deconstruct that very quickly? And immediately they'll say, well that's, well, that's not really what I intended. And suddenly, immediately they're on the defensive. So scratch where they're itching first. Get their positions first on these areas. And then scratch where they're not itching. Now, this is where you need to start introducing the gospel. I've heard so many people who have relationships with Muslims all over the world, and you, they have glowing prayer letters. But you, what you find when you actually start down and get to talk with them is they go to their house and they come to their house, but they don't ever, ever get to a discussion about Jesus Christ because they're so scared that when they introduce Jesus Christ, they're going to ruin their relationship. Sooner or later, you're going to have to introduce Jesus into the equation. And the sooner, the better. They will introduce it once they find out that you're a Christian, especially in Europe, because they're well aware of the fact that Christianity does define itself by who Jesus is. We call ourselves Christians for a reason. We follow Christ, and they, they pretty well know that we believe that Christ is the God, that Christ is Lord. The, by definition, that's going to be controversial. All right? You're not going to get away from it. We'll show you how Andy and I will give, give you some ideas of what you can do with it when it comes up. I, we like, to, we like to, the, to use the, what we call the three C's. Be quick, be concise, yet comprehensive. I know I can't spell. Nonetheless, those are the three C's that we always try to keep to. And the problem is that those of us in the West are not very good uh, at saying things quickly and concisely, yet comprehensively. We tend to be very verbose. We tend to go on and waffle on, waffle on. By that time, you've lost your audience. We say uh, at Speaker's Corner, if you're going to get up on the ladder, you better be able to say exactly what you're saying in two minutes. That's all about, about all the time you're going to give. I was interested to hear David Cook said it's 60 seconds now. You've got to get what you're going to say in 60 seconds on radio and then, other than that, then hit it with music immediately afterwards. Otherwise, they're not going to record you. Now, Muslims do have a little bit better attention span, I think, than, than 60 seconds. But certainly, learn how to defend yourself. Learn how to answer these questions at least within two minutes. Not more if you can hear it. But at the same time, make sure you get content in there. Make sure you're comprehensive enough so the question is answered. We seek erudition, seek simplicity. We tend to be verbose, be succinct. You don't have to have the whole answer, in the, in the, uh, the entire answer in the answer. Do you see what I'm saying? You notice how uh, William Craig very rarely speaks very long when he's answering. Did you notice how quick he was yesterday? He just said all that needed to be said. And then he shut up and went to the next question. You do not have to be ex expounder. You don't have to be completely comprehensive. Be careful because that is how you will lose your audience. You need to be quick and concise. It's difficult, I know, especially for those of us from America. There is a need to be multifaceted in your response. Need not only defend, but also go on the offense. Apologetics and polemics. Those who defend the goal, those who actually go and make the strikes are the polemicists. Both ironical and confrontational. There's no reason in the world why you have to confront unless, you really, unless it comes to the fore. That, but ironical means friendship, being friendly. Sorry, that's a technical word. 
those are the two, basically those are the two opposites, those are the two contrasts, ironical and confrontational. And the reason we do this is so that the onus is not always on us. What we find at Speaker's Corner is that the tendency is that almost all the accusations are, are one way. They're all the accusations are by Islam against Christianity. And you can spend a whole afternoon, and all you're doing is defending, 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 and you're backing up, backing up, backing up. And the, the perception is by the crowd who's listening is that we have all the problems. We have got all the difficulties. And I don't want to walk away with that kind of perception. I want to make sure that they realize that not only do we have these difficulties, but they have a far great, greater problem. But by doing that, I can also then interject the gospel into that and show what is it we have that stands against what they have. Remember what uh, Bruce Winter said. You've got to break down those bastards. You've got to break down their categories and then introduce the gospel into that. Um, when I get up on a ladder, a lot of times, I'll hold these two books in my hand. And I'll say the Quran and the Bible. I'll make sure the Quran's bigger, smaller than my Bible. I do that purposely, symbolically. Which is the Word of God? You, know, you have two revelations, both claiming to be from God, yet they're contradictory. God does not contradict himself. What, how are we going to come to some kind of conclusion? And that gets a huge crowd. And so what I'll do, then I'll say, well, I'm going to use some criteria that you will understand. We'll try to use something that's as neutral as possible. Let's use documentary material. Let's look at the, uh, the, let's look at the manuscript between the two books. Let's look at the content. Let's look at God in both books. And they see which is the real God, the God of the Quran or the God of the Bible. Let's look at something like sin. We'll just take one category per week. All right, or is Winnie the Pooh found in this book or this book? <laughs> Thanks, Andy. We need to show confidence, and I'll just continue on down. Mannerisms. We need to be gentle yet passionate, considerate yet forthright. How you say it is almost as important as what you say. I did a, a talk in Dublin about a year and a half ago at the Royal College of Surgeons where there was 80% of the student body was Islamic. I think I told, did I tell the story yesterday? All right, and I, they called me over because they need some help. They need some real help there. In the middle of Dublin, of all places, 80% of the student body, Islamic. And that, that's, we're finding that right across the UK. I was also asked to fly up to Scotland in, um, help me here, what's the big city, not Edinburgh, just north of Edinburgh? North by Dundee. D, Dundee, Dundee, at the uh, college, uh, Medical College of Dundee. And there, 15% of the student body is Islamic. Guys and Tommy in London, isn't it 50%? Or is it, which one is it that's 50%? It is Guys and Tommy. Now, when I was over there in the Royal College of Servants, they asked me to do a talk, a 20-minute talk, and then they opened it up to questions. And there was about 60 Muslims there in the audience. There was only about 20 or 30 Christians, which is normal. That happens a lot uh, whenever we have these kind of meetings, an open meeting. And they started throwing all kinds of questions about what I'd said. And it was going fast and furious. But that, by that time, the meeting had to come to a close. So they said, well, Mr. Smith will come in front, and anybody who wants to stay can come and ask him a question. Well, all the Muslims stayed, and they came and surrounded me completely surrounded by about these 60 Muslims while the Christians were all up against the wall on either side just watching. And it went on for about another two hours. And we were going fast and furious, back and forth. And they were grabbing my lapel, and I grabbed their lapel right back. And they were demanding that I take back what I said. I said, I will not, because at least I can source it. Can you source what you're saying? And I would not let them get away with saying things about my scriptures of my Lord. It was really fast and furious. I had spittle all over me. They had spittle all over them. At the end of two hours... It was time to close out. We need to get the janitor had come to close the building down. So as we were leading, leaving, the, in, the protagonist, uh, Nasser, the, man, the man that was responsible for uh, the Muslim side, the one who was the, the uh, student pre body president, who had done most of the attacks against Christianity there in that meeting, came up to me and he shook my hand. He says, Mr. Smith, we like you because you care about us. Now, can you see what is going on here? I was just as aggressive as they were. I was just as passionate as they were. I had gave as much spittle as they gave me as much spittle. Back and forth, back and forth. After two hours, they realized that though they had many problems with my scriptures, I had just as many as, as, as with them. And they said, when can we do this again? When can we do this again? Now, most of us would say, hold on a minute. That's not right. We should not be arguing. We should not be raising our voice. Yet, for as far as the Muslims are concerned, they did not listen to me unless I did raise my voice. They were not convinced about what I was saying unless I showed I was convincing. I was up on the ladder at Speaker's Corner once, and a guy named Muhammad came up to me, and I was talking about Muhammad, his namesake, and he got so upset. He took the ladder, and he threw it down, and I jumped off. Put the ladder back on, I got back up again. And a second time, he threw me off the ladder. Three times, he threw me off the ladder. Once, twice, thrice. By that time, you know, I was getting fed up. I'm getting fed up trying to jump out of his way. So I got off, and I went up to Muhammad, and he says, Mr. Smith, why do you say these things about Muhammad? It makes me angry. 
now Muhammad and I know each other. I've known him for about one or two years. And as I was saying this, an Irish fellow came up to us and says, what are you two talking to each other for? You hate each other. Immediately, Muhammad came, put his arm around me, turned to the Irish man and says, this man is my brother, you are not. This man believes in heaven and hell, I believe in heaven and hell, you are not. This man believes in God, I believe in God, you are not. You do not. He is my brother, you are not my brother. Right immediately, without even taking a breath, the same fellow who had just thrown me off the ladder three times was calling me his brother. Can you see what's going on here? As far as he was concerned, because of the fact that I would not run away, because of the fact that I did not get uh, uh, intimidated by the fact that he would throw me off the ladder, because I held my ground and was, at the same time did not call him names or did not in any way uh, uh, castigate him, because I held my ground, I was his brother. And he saw in me a commonality, the fact that we both believed in God, we both believed in prophets, we both believed in heaven and hell. That was important to him. And not this Irish man who had nothing in common with him because he did not, not have any belief, but he was not willing to hold to those beliefs, not publicly anyhow. I'm sorry, did you say uh, every session as a student? Uh, did you say spittle? Or? Spittle means uh, um, <laughs> spit saliva. When you talk very quickly and very fast, close to each other, the saliva kind of covers your front. <laughs> I know, I mean, it, was, um, it was, yeah, after two hours of it, it was all over me and it was all over him. Uh, but, you know, that's just expected when you get that close. Don't run away from it. Maybe we should have class classes in spittle economy. There you go. Um, let's look at some of the internal, external fa fallacies. These are fallacies that are quite common. Good. Yeah. Yes, they won't ever admit that they have lost, that they have lost the argument. It's the people who are watching who decide that. And it's not for me to say you've lost. I don't say that. I don't make that a point. I don't even care. I'm not there to win the battle. I'm there to present the gospel and to do it convincingly so that the hearers are convinced. And I don't even sit there and say, now, who won that? I don't, it's, not, it's not for me to say who won that exchange. But I am concerned that the way I say it is as important as what I say. That's what really concerns me, because as Christians, we don't do that. Um, the example that I gave a lot of is when I was in a mosque with, a, with a, a Turkish fellow in Paris. We were both learning French, and none of us knew French at that time. We both could speak English, and so he wanted me to go to his mosque, and I was going to take him to my church. We went to the central mosque there in Paris, and uh, it was a... It was an Algerian mosque, large, about, uh, about 2,000 people inside, and uh, we, everything was in French. And, of course, we can understand a word at that time because we were just beginning. But as the imam started, he started softly, and he got louder and louder. And as he got louder, people were started going, Alu Akbar. And, he, and pretty soon, my friend Ishmael started yelling, Alu Akbar. And pretty soon, he was going like this, Alu Akbar, oh, yeah, Alu Akbar, oh, that's good, that's good. And I turned to him, and I said, Ishmael, what are you saying? I said, isn't that good, Jay? Isn't that great? I said, I don't know. I don't know a word he's saying, and you don't know a word. I don't care, but isn't it great? <laughs> For him, it didn't matter what the man was saying. It was how he said it. It was the fact that he would look so convincing and that everybody else was responding to it. Now, sooner or later, he's going to have to find out what the man was saying. But as far as, it, as he was concerned, he was so excited to see that that man was convincing. He was hoping that I would be as convinced as well. And it was certainly convincing him. And I went, walked away, and I realized, my goodness, we've lost something here as missionaries. As missiologists, we have lost the fact that not only what is important, but how we say it is important. Now, that doesn't mean we just go out and have no content. No, be careful. But the thing is, we do have the content already. We've got the material. We're just not packaging it right. Uh, let me get her first, and we'll come to you, Stuart. Go ahead, Beck. Well, obviously, you've done, a, you've done a great bit right there to get them to that point. What the next, the next thing is, listen, let's talk about the content of what you're saying, and let's see whether or not we do agree with each other. The next time we meet, I want to ask that question, whether we do really agree with each other. Let's take one ca category. Let's take the, the character of God, the personhood of God. Who is God? You, decide, you come next week with who God is to you, and I'll come next week with who God is to me, and let's just see how, how far we do agree with each other, because I don't think we do agree. 
You may think so, because of so far, that's all. That's the only message that's come across. But next week, let's do something and find out whether we do agree. You might, if you want to jump right into it, talk about the person of Jesus Christ and see how they agree. Did he or did he not die on the cross? These are things that you can start pushing that to the next level. Okay? Yeah. Go ahead. Jace, it's very encouraging. Um, uh, but I know that um, having had no experience of that, if I was surrounded by 20 Muslims giving me a hard time, I'd do my best to keep on um, you know, standing up for what I believe and what have you. But there will come a time when I was thinking to myself, I want to be out of there, I want to be out of there. And yet at the, other, at the same time, I'd be thinking, but if I do back off and I do come out of here, perhaps that's going to... You know, not the right impression. No, so then you need to, so in, in a situation mind? like that, make sure you do have a time limit. Yeah. We always say five o'clock. I'm going to go to five. I'm, listen, guys, you've got only 10 minutes left. Let's make sure we get some good discussion in. We only have 10 minutes left. And say, listen, I've, I need to get out of here. I have to be somewhere else. I need to get back to, you know, whatever the situation is. But say that at the very beginning, if, the, if you know that's going to be a problem. So you do have an out. And then if you haven't finished up, say, next week, let's continue this next week. That gives you not only an out, but also it shows, says that you're, you're coming back to finish it off what you've started. Yeah. And I find that they don't have a problem with that. If suddenly in the middle of a conversation and you aren't and you haven't finished your point and you've got to go, they will see it as you're trying to get out of there. Now, maybe not. At Speaker's Corner, they make a big, big ballyhoo about that all the time. Oh, you're scared. You're running away. No, no, I'm not. I said, listen, I'm till five o'clock. We're going to be here till five o'clock. I've got to go. I've got people who are meeting me. Once you do that, once you say that, there's no, whether they, they come to that conclusion or not, everybody, no one else will come to that conclusion. They may say that, but the others won't, won't see that at all. Yeah, they'll be fair. I don't think you should have too much of a problem with that. Again, it will be intimidating the first few times because you'll feel like, goodness sakes, I'm not sure I know all these answers. My goodness, these are new ones. Hold on a minute. Have I said the right thing? These are all these little doubts that will be impinging on you. But each time it gets better, each time it gets easier. And what's the great thing about it? You'll learn your answers very quick so they won't have that problem in the future. Good. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Yes, be careful. This is only for Europe, okay? This is a European forum. We're really telling you how to do it here. In Europe, you can do all of these paradigms. You can use all of these ideas. Once you get into the Muslim world, you're going to have to start obviously changing it. And I can't say depend, because in some countries, yes, you can. In Pakistan, you can do this. In Turkey, you can do this. Other countries, you need to be very careful. In other countries, you can't even begin to use some of these, some of these um, uh, strategies. Unless you have a relationship or unless you're in a private home. But obviously, no. This is for Europe. But the thing is, there's so many of them here. We've got it right on our doorstep. And they're coming more and more. So our Czech brother here is already realizing this is going to be the next step. He realizes, and he's trying to get ready now, so when they do come to the Czech Republic, he'll be ready for it. But in Czech Republic, you have all the right, and you have the freedom to say, and to discuss, and also, yes, to, to actually go on the offensive. That's the beauty of living in Europe. Thank God we still have those freedoms. Okay? Now, um, what do you want to do, Randy? We're... Let's go right into the questions, okay? Why don't you come up here, Andy? Andy and I are going to... Um, if you look at the page one and page two and three, these are the questions that we get hit with the most. These are... And I put them into two different sections. One is FAQs, frequently asked questions concerning Christianity. And then you have frequently asked questions concerning Islam. Yeah. What are the questions that you get hit with? Let's put them up here, and if they if they are if any of them are parallel, if I think the first one that came up is what do we do with the Trinity? This gentleman here yeah. talked about the Trinity. That's one that we get hit with all the time. Now let me tell you what. Let me while he's putting that up there, I'll tell you what I do, and I'll let Andy say what he does. On the Trinity, be very careful. Almost always, the Trinity is a red herring. Muslims really, if they ask the question, if that's the first question they ask you, you pretty well know that they don't want an answer you pretty well know that really what they're about is they're trying to find a chink in your armor. They know good and well that that's the most difficult question for us to ask, answer publicly and certainly the most difficult to do so in two minutes. All right? Usually, they really don't care about the Trinity. They don't expect you to have an answer. I have not heard of anybody ever committing their lives to the Lord because of the Trinity, not from Islam. So don't waste your time on the Trinity. That's what I say, and I say it to my students, because what happens all the time, once you get on the Trinity, you can't get away from it. And you can spend an entire afternoon just talking about that, and they'll give you one question after another question after another question, and you're sitting, though you may answer, they'll go to the next question, you have not get yourself anywhere. So this is what I always do. To find out whether they really are mean, whether they really want to find an answer to the Trinity, I, I ask them one very quick question. I say, listen, 
I'm not going to tell you what I feel personally about the Trinity because I didn't meet my Lord Jesus Christ because of the Trinity. In fact, I found out about it afterwards. Most people in this room, I don't think, were converted because of the Trinity. You usually find out about it in Bible school or when you open your scriptures. However, what I will say is it's, high, it's, it's enormously important to me. But the only way I can understand the Trinity is to go to my Bible. I have to go to scripture to find the Trinity. Not the word. The word doesn't exist in the Bible. Just like Tawhi, which is the most important uh, theology, the most important criteria for Islam is not found in the Quran. You will not find the word Tawhi in the Quran. Yet every Muslim knows that God is one. So don't ask me to find Trinity in the Bible. It was a word that was created, was put together by Tertullian in about the second century. But the concept, the idea of God as three, yet one, is right through the Bible. And I will take you to those passages. Are you ready to come with me? If you're not willing to come with me, then don't waste my time. Because I will not just tell you my opinion. I will not just spend all my time trying to help you understand what my experience is with the Trinity. That's not going to persuade you. I know it's not going to persuade you. It's never going to persuade a Muslim. It's the Word of God that will reveal it to you. Because I know the Trinity because of what God has told me in Scripture. Are you willing to do that? If they say yes, then bring them aside, sit down, and start going through the passages. Start with Genesis 1.1. Elohim, Bara, the third person, the three per three God, uh, the God who is plural, three or more, Bara creates singularly. I have my favorite passages. I like Exodus 19, where God on the mountain has Moses come up, and God on the mountain says that tomorrow God is going to come down. This is God saying that God is going to come down. That's brilliant to say one God seemingly telling Moses, prepare yourself. Prepare your nation because God is going to come down to the mountain tomorrow. God saying that God is going to descend. Or Exodus 33, there's a great one where Moses, and that good one about that one is the same story is also found in the Quran. It's the story of the burning bush, which stipulates and categorically says that nobody can see God face to face and live. And yet, just about 20 verses before that, there is Moses face to face with God as if to a friend. So it's seemingly contradictory unless you understand that you're talking about the first person plus the second person. So there are... So the question is, uh, how, God, how can God have a son? Okay, how can God have a son? And that usually is a second question. If, you've gone, if they've gone past the Trinity, then they'll go right to how can God have a son. And I say, listen, first of all, let's define what we mean by son. You're looking at it as a biological son. And I see that the real problem is that you're actually reflecting what the Quran says. In Surah 5, Ayah 116, it asks the question, how could you, O oh Mary, or, or Jesus, how could you and your mother be worshipped as of God? Assuming that Jesus and Mary and God the Father are part of the Trinity. It's got the wrong Trinity. So first of all, they're asking the question from the wrong precept. In fact, I would like to know why that verse is in the Quran, since there's no Christians I know that believe that Mary is part of the Trinity. She's not a God. None of, no one, none of us believe that she's part of the Godhead. So it looks like that that is an error built into the Quran. God does not make that kind of error. It puts him on a defensive. But also I'll say I know where they got that from because there was a group that lived in the, in the 7th century who were a, a sect of Christianity called Coloridians, and they did have that belief. They did have that theology. It looks like that theology was borrowed and incorporated into the Quran. But then, for heaven's sakes, don't uh, expose and don't put that on me. None of us, no Christians in this room, believe that Mary's part of the Trinity. So what Trinity are you talking about? Then also... If, I'm sorry, what uh, God are you talking about? And I'd also say, can, the real question is, if God cannot have a son, does that mean God cannot come down to earth? That's the real problem is what they're saying. God cannot come down and become a man. God could not come down and actually be involved in his creation. And what they're saying there, and I think you, you, you need to really nip that one in the blood, bud and say very quickly, do you not believe that God is omnipotent? Yes. Every Muslim will say yes. Well, if he's omnipotent, then in his omnipotence, could he not also enter his, his own creation? See, my God can. My God can enter time and space. And he did. He's done so many times. And not only that, your Quran even suggests that that could be. Because in Surah 39, 4, chapter 39, Surah 4, 39, Ayah 4, it says, If God had so willed it, he could have a son in black and white. So the possibility even exists in your Quran that God could have a son. But more than that, I think what you're reflecting is a view of God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob don't, don't know because the God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew, who you claim to be an inheritance from, they knew God personally. God was in their presence. Abraham was there in the presence of God, Yahweh, and he had dinner with him. Moses knew God intimately. That was God that was in the burning bush. We've got the same bridge there. We've got the same story. Jacob wrestled with him. 
So show these theophanies that were, exist in the Old Testament, and I tell my Muslim friends, the problem is that you don't have a big enough God. Your God maybe cannot come to earth. Mine can't. Get a bigger God. And get a God that comes in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm sorry? Only be, yeah. And the word begotten is the one they like to use. Yeah. Do you want to answer that one, Andy? But before we do that... Well, I was going to say the Trinity generally. Why don't you just do the Trinity real quickly, how you do it? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, I have an overlapping model for Jay. Um, one thing I found very helpful that Jay said earlier is that when the question comes at you from Muslims, not only is it a good to answer, it's good to turn it around and fire it right back. And my approach, um, if a Muslim asks me about the Trinity, one of the first things I say to them is, well, I'm happy to talk to you about the Trinity and about my concept of God, but can I just clarify a question about your concept of God to start with. And then like, I would grab my Quran and say, well, tell me, do you believe that the Quran is eternal? And it's always existed on the eternal tablets in heaven? Or do you believe it's been created? It's not that Allah at some point stepped in and created the Quran. Now, those of you who aren't aware of this issue, this is a major issue in Islamic theology because Orthodox Islam believes that the Quran is actually eternal and uncreated. Up there in heaven, alongside Allah, and are the stone tablets on which the Quran has always existed. Says that. I forget the reference off the top of my head. It's 8522. Very much. My new bit. But um, there was a brief controversy <laughs> early in Islamic theology when an alternative view that the Quran was created, uh, put forward by the Mutazilites, um, came into circulation, but that got squashed. And Orthodox Islam has always said that the Quran is uncreated. Of course, if you have an uncreated eternal Quran, therefore you have a problem. You have two eternal entities. So, despite the fact that Muslims claim to be purely monotheist, if you do actually have this strange position with Allah and the Quran next side to, uh, sitting next, side, next, next door to him. The Quran also says that God sits on an eternal throne. Uh, next to him is a book in which all these deeds that have ever happened in the whole of the earth are written down and there's an eternal pen right away on that. So Islam has a whole series of entities um, next to God in heaven. And uh, when you bring that up with Muslims, I tend to find that the question about the Trinity sort of evaporates because the presupposition behind the question about the Trinity is that our view of God is, is, is complicated, we can't explain it, it's Greek, it's plural, and theirs is very simple and straightforward. And the moment actually we start trying to defend the Trinity too quickly, um, I think we're actually buying into that presupposition. <coughs> so one of the things that's very helpful is to help a Muslim reflect, particularly some of these groups that Jay was talking about, like the Turkish guys, who may not know their own tradition so well, actually raising these problems with them is actually in Look on page two, number seven, and Andy's got, what, what Andy's saying there, in the in the blue, Islamic Trinity. Yeah, got God there. Allah, there are the references, Surah two twenty nine, yeah. and the word, the eternal tablet that he's referring to, it's underlined Surah eighty five, Ayah twenty two, yeah. and the spirit. Good stuff. On, um, in terms of explaining the Trinity biblically, um, won't spend too much time on this, but Jay has talked about some of the texts he has about the Old Testament theophanies, which I think is always very helpful. But a model I've used. Uh, it's a book I came across a few years ago when I was an undergraduate, and I highly recommend it to you if you can get hold of a copy. Uh, it's written by a guy called Richard Borkham, who's a New Testament scholar at St Andrews University um, in Scotland, and it's called God Crucified. And uh, basically, his argument is that the way that most Christians talk about the Trinity, we, we tend to do it in, in Greek cat categories, because when the creeds were written down, they were in a Greek context. But what those, what those early church fathers were contextualising in the creeds was effectively first century Jewish thought, i.e. the New Testament writers are Jews. So the way they talk about the identity of Jesus is in Jewish terms, and then Walken proceeds to unpack that. And his argument is very, very simple. He says this, for a first century Jew, um, the way that you marked off God as distant from the, all, from the rest of reality was in three fairly straightforward ways. God was the creator of everything, everything else was created. God was the ruler of everything, everything else was, was under his sovereign power. And above all, how did you mark, how did you demonstrate that? Well, you worshipped God and you didn't worship anything else. Then we proceed to look and see what the first Christians did. Now, the first Christians used language about Jesus that includes him in the, in the creative power of God. We have Jesus creating and involved in creation. Um, wisdom language from the Old Testament is applied to Jesus, places like Colossians um, and other places in the New Testament. Um, furthermore, uh, Jesus is ascended to the right hand of the throne of God and sits there exercising rule. Um, in, a Jewish cult, in Jewish language, that's extremely high language, higher than we find of other um, kind of agents in, in Jewish theology. And above all, um, recent studies have shown that every layer of early Christianity, right back to the year dot, the first Christians worshipped Jesus. So in Jewish terms, i.e. there was some language that was available to them, 
they included Jesus and the identity of God. That's the phrase that Paul Richard Borkin uses. Rather than trying to talk about him as the second person of the Trinity, it's this kind of language. He says the first Christian included Jesus in God's identity. And that's actually the answer I give to Muslims. If Muslims say to me, do you believe Jesus is God? I go, yeah, I believe Jesus belongs to the unique identity of God. And that's really helpful because when we use that phrase, is everybody going, oh, what does that mean? Oh, let me explain that to you. Um, let me give you a bit of space. Okay, let, let's get some other questions and just write them up. What are some other questions? We'll put a list of them. Yeah. Go ahead. Christianity is immoral. Correct. Christianity is immoral. Yours over there? I'm sorry? Oh, sorry, the Bambakam, his book. Any other questions? Your Bible is corrupted? Okay. Well, you can give that to him afterwards. No, but that's fine. Okay. 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 The Bible is corrupted. What else? The Bible doesn't say that Jesus is God. Bible doesn't say, Je- where does Jesus claim to be God in the Bible? That's usually what they ask. Where does Jesus say, I am God? Okay, what else? Jesus didn't die on the cross. Okay, Jesus didn't die on the cross. Any others that you get hit by? Or you will get hit by? <laughs> okay. Let's take those ones to begin with. Okay, Christianity is immoral. Again, that's one obviously asked them, where is it immoral? What? America, in England, we've seen pornography, we've seen television, we've seen what your women dress like. And okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. Therefore, all the West is, is Christian, therefore is it corrupt. And this is a good one because you can then break down two misconceptions simultaneously. One, the misconception about Christianity and another misconception about the West. And say categorically that in Christianity, every person chooses it for themselves. It's a personal choice. You were not born a Christian, although many people would claim that they are Christian. You have to choose it for yourself. It's an individual choice. The reason why they even ask that question is they're starting from their own premise. A Muslim is born a Muslim. You do not choose it. So they assume that everybody that is born in a Christian family is automatically a Christian. So that's a misconception you've got to break down. Say, listen, no, we do not, as Muslims, you were not born. Though you may grow up in a Christian family, that is not good enough. Every person must make that personal choice. So the vast majority of people you see walking around the streets here, though they may, if you ask them they are Christians, they probably never go to a church, except maybe on Christmas or Easter or maybe for a wedding or a funeral, and that's about it. Now, help them to understand that. Unlike Islam, Christianity defines itself by those who have made that personal choice, that personal commitment. Now, the immorality that they're reflecting there, the immorality they see, are not by those who, go, who call themselves Christians. They are not the ones who certainly, that you're not aware of, they're the ones that, they are, that go to your church. But then ask now you talk to me. I am a Christian, and you ask me what kind of morality I You're have. Bishop, okay, then ask so and so over there. He's a Christian. Go to him. He's not a bishop. Ask him how he lives. And what I usually do whenever I'm in a debate, when this comes up, I have all the Christians raise their hand. I purposely do that. And I say I want you Muslims to see the hands of those Christians there, and I want you to go to every one of them afterwards, and you ask them how they live, and ask them about morality. Ask them how they dress. And then you will find how the Christian is defined and how they live. Because obviously your perception of Christianity is skewed. And I would be careful before I'd say that everybody's a Muslim unless you tell me that which, which ones are defined as a real Muslim. Because Muslims, many Imams are also Christ, are Muslims and they do many things that are very immoral. In fact, would you say the, the Imams are Muslim because by the fact that most of the Imams in Bradford, a lot of the Imams have been found as punters with prostitutes. Does that make that they're more Muslim? There you will find tit for tat on both sides. But to define a Christian are those who not only follow Jesus Christ, but also, through the Holy Spirit, live the life that Jesus gives. And it's fascinating because immediately then you can start saying, now let me tell you what that life is. Let me tell you what a Christian is, what it means to be a Christian. Immediately you've got the ball by the horn and you can start actually feeding in some information. And it's great to do that and I think it's important because that is a good question.
was um, be careful. Not be careful, because immediately you're, what you're doing is you're trying to defend that practice, or you're, and they'll think that you're trying to defend that, per, that certain bishop. Say, listen, there, if you, and you can, there's certain Stuart, you can do that. I choose not to do that, because I want to make sure what the paradigms are, rather than talking about individuals or yeah. persons. I said, let's look and see what a Christian is. Rather than saying, these are failed models, I don't want to spend my whole time trying to say why they're failed or not failed. Let's just see what the paradigm is. And I, that's, I do that with everything when, when, when it comes on violence. And they say, what about the Crusades? I said, rather than talk about whether the Crusades were good or bad or whether I accept them or not, I'll say, what does Jesus Christ say about the Crusades? Immediately I get back to Jesus Christ. And I say, Jesus would have condemned it. Why? Because Jesus believes in peace. And I quote then Matthew twenty six fifty two. Immediately it gets it back onto my paradigm, back onto my model. And I want to elevate that rather than trying to sit there the whole time, trying to bandy around whether or not I like or dislike the Crusades or, or anything else. Yeah, always get back to the paradigm. Always get back to the model. James, as far as the morality issue, the Christian morality and the, and the uh, Muslim morality, how do they differ? All right, now this is a question that you just want as, as general information. Uh, it, it depends, on the, and it depends on, the, on, on the categories. If it's women's issue, there's quite a bit difference. If it comes to immorality, when it's sexual immorality, it's very much the same. They would be co with us on abortion. They would co- be co with us on most categories, except obviously when it comes to uh, uh, violence, crime, but one of the best ones probably to get onto is women's issues because that's the easiest one to use because they'll immediately stipulate that there are certain characteristics that women must fit into that we would not agree with. There you can, yeah, and, and there, is a, there is a very profitable way, to, a very profitable comparison. Women, I, tell, I ask women to do that all the time. Becky. Say that again. Christian women, if you can witness to Muslims, what is appropriate for them to wear? Because some dress practically like the Muslims do, like some headscarf, and the others dress practically like everybody else in the culture. And so you're asking me, what is, what is the happy medium? I... Every, I, I, what I would do in your case, I say, what do I feel comfortable with? Obviously, there are some rules that society has imposed upon me. But as a Christian, we do pretty much know, uh, depending on who, which church we're talking about, what, how we define modesty. And every woman has that right. But what I will say is, the great thing about that is that the woman then prays about it, and she goes bef- between her God, and it's between her and her God as to how she defines modesty. Now, if her definition of modesty does go beyond the boundaries of the church, the elders of the church are going to go talk to her. But the great thing about it is that we do have that freedom. It's not stipulated by a, a paradigm that, or a model that comes from the seventh century that I'm not even sure is a, even a uh, correct model. Even many Muslim women are saying that today. And that's imposed right across the board uh, uh, and, uh, uh, in every culture. The other thing that I, that I think is very important on this issue is ask the, the Muslim uh, who you're talking to, if it's a woman or if it's a man, why is it that women must be covered up in Islam? What's the purpose? Ask them. Get behind it. What's the purpose of wearing the hijab or what's the purpose of wearing the chador or the purda? And what they will say, invariably, if, you really, if they're really honest, and of course, if they're not, not all of them are knowledgeable, sometimes it's just tradition's sake. But if they are, are aware of what the Quran says, they will realize that the reason the woman is covered up is because of the fact that she must not seduce the men. She must not show her beauty. So I say, okay, if that's the case, then who's at fault here? Are the women at fault or are the men at fault? And who's paying the penalty for the fault of the men? Because it is the men who are at fault. So therefore, how is it by covering the woman up that you're solving the problem? It's like a cancer. Would a doctor put a band-aid on a cancer? No, he would attack the cancer. And yet you're putting a band-aid on something that's not attacking the real problem. The heart of the problem is the, is the evilness of man's heart. And you're going to have to deal with those men. But the, the Islam does not do that by just covering the women up, packaging them up, and hoping that the men will take care of that. And the irony of, is it, of it is that which they cannot touch here, which they may not because of their beauty, because it might get their minds off God, is waiting for abundance in heaven. Look at that contradiction. Use that and ask that. Go ahead, Paul. Whether this 
this is actually a valuable spot. It may be something they stay in the United Kingdom or more traditional societies. I wonder if we do have any different concepts of morality, even marriage and such like. And even, even if, I, I, I'm not even, I, I don't want, well, I don't know, that, have they actually got a theology on abortion and gay and stuff like they, they have a theology that is a practical theology that, you, that what they call uh, ijma. Ijma or ijtihad. Ijma ijtihad means you take something that is a modern problem that is not di dictated in, uh, in ancient scripts and you come to a modern opinion by those who are learned. Uh, so therefore, ijtihad would give them the ability, imam state, the ability to say that abortions are not permitted because it, it prevents the, the, um, the, uh, pre pre prevents the, the um, conception of life. Uh, as far as immorality and women's uh, issues are concerned, be careful because an awful lot of the examples that you may give have, are not Islamic problems, these are cultural problems. I know one of the favorite ones in Britain to use around is clitoridectomy. And clitoridectomy is not really an Islamic problem. It's not, there's, there's not any reference that supports it. There is one or two hadith that seem to support it, but almost every Muslim scholar I know, at least in the West, would be very quick to say that's not a Muslim problem, because even the Christian church in, the church, uh, in Egypt has that problem. So it's a much more of a cultural problem. And that may be the case uh, certainly with honor killings. That's not necessarily a Muslim problem. Those are ad adaptations of uh, punishments that are dictated on those who, uh, who are in, a, in an Islamic context. Or the whole thing with child marriages, uh, women, uh, female uh, bride burning. Those are much more of an India uh, problem in India, Muslims. Not a problem so much that it's found, certainly not, it cannot be substantiated by the Quran. Even the chador and the burqa is not found in the Quran. And I know some of the Muslim women, who, modern Muslim women, are trying to now eradicate that. And if you look at the veiling that is found in the Quran, that's only for the Prophet's wives, not for all women. Okay, did you, are there anything you want to say on that, Andy? No, I think after the morality thing. Go ahead, yeah. Within the Quran or in the tradition, a man can marry his four wives. Up to four wives is in the Quran, yes, that's, that's quite well. But Muhammad married 12. Again, that's well. Again, but you're immediately you're imposing your uh, your criteria on morality there, and they would say, "Be careful, because you're imposing." And I, be, I I don't want Muslims to impose their morality on me, their criteria. For a Muslim, they would say it's perfectly legitimate because at that time there were a lot more women because men were being killed off in battles like the Battle of Yamama, and during the conquest, a lot of men were dying, and so they had all these widows who needed to have husbands. And so you can see how it made sense then. That what I would say today is, okay, but we're no longer in that type of context. Now, I don't know, does anybody who, met, who knows the statistics now, how many girls, you met people, how many girls to boys are born, racial? In India. Yeah. In, the, in the West, for instance. Slightly more boys than girls, mm -hmm. maybe 53. More boys than girls? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it does not justify polygamy. Not no, four no. wives to every man. Yeah, and so there's the difficulty. And I always say, listen, if you're going to marry four wives, you've got four mother-in-laws you've got to worry about. <laughs> but certainly... Oh, in your case, no. Now... The, all right, okay. So you have one done. There you go. All right, let's go on to the next one. Um, corrupted Bible. I think we covered that a little bit. We always said, if that comes up, and it will come up right at the very beginning, you need to deal with it. Right off the bat, I ask them two questions. Where and when. If it's, they say it was corrupted before the time of Muhammad, then you've got to go to the Quran itself. And I will open up the Quran and say, I want you to go and I want you to ask me, what are you going to do with these verses in the Quran? Surah 21.7, Surah uh, 10.94, Surah 29.46. I think you've got them on your paper there. I don't think you need to write them down. Yeah, here we go. If you look here on page one. Surah 1094, Surah 21.7 says basically the same thing. Muslims must ask Christians. If they have any questions, they're to come to the people of the book and ask them. It says in both those surahs. In Surah 29.46, that's one of my favorite ones. It says, do not dispute with the Christians. I love to use that at Speaker's Corner. Don't dispute with me. You're not to argue with me. Because I have been given the Taurat and the Injil as signs for you. In Surah 4, Ayah 36, 136, it says, O ye Muslims are to believe in the scriptures that have come before you. They're to believe in the Bible. There it is, black and white. In Surah 5, 46, it is 47, and also verse 68, it says, Oh, you Christians, you are to believe in that scripture which God has given you. We're to believe in our scriptures. 
And then, of course, Surah 2, 136, no difference between the Bible and the Quran. So over and over and over again, the Quran talks about our scriptures as being authoritative, that the Muslims are supposed to come to those scriptures, they're not supposed to argue to us, uh, with us about it, and that they are signs for them, both the Taurat and the Injil. So once you see it there, I said, why in the world then does God tell you to go to a corrupted scripture? And why is it that there is no warning whatsoever in the Quran that warns you about that corruption? It doesn't exist. And I, I put the challenge out all the time. Show me one verse that talks about a previous corruption of scripture. It doesn't exist. Now, I've been asking this for 12 years, actually 20 years, and I've yet to hear a Muslim. They will try to get, take you to, uh, there's a one reference in Surah 2. Uh, do I have it here? T yeah. Surah 2, Ayah 75 to 79, and also Surah 5, Ayah 13. Those references refer to the fact that the Jews at the time of Muhammad were changing it. They were actually, if you look at the tafsir that follows that in, Buha, in Baidawi and Zamakshari, they're referring to the fact that when the Jews, when the Muslims came to Deuteronomy 18, 18 verse 15, it says, Moses quotes saying, For there will come after me a prophet like unto me. And the Jews tried to cover that up with their hands, according to the tafsir, so that Muhammad could not read it. And so he was warning them about the Jews who were doing that at his time period, during his time period. That doesn't say the scriptures were corrupted. It says the Jews were covering it. Get the story right. And I, now, they will, that obviously, they will try to say that's a proof of corruption of Scripture. You will not find any reference to a corruption of Scripture in the Quran, or the Hadith, or the Sirah, or the Tafsir, or the Tahrik. The first reference we can find of a, corrupt, a, a dynamic corruption of Scripture is from a man named Ibn, um, I think I've got it here, in 1011, I'm sorry, 1064, and his name is, is Ibn Hazm. I think I've got it here somewhere. Ibn Hazm is the first one that we can find any refer reference to to a previous corruption scripture. It's not here, it's in the next paper. Ibn Hazm talks about it in 1064. It's not till the 11th century that we finally find this corruption as a polemic. Now, that's 400 years later. It takes them 400 years to realize we've got a corrupted scripture. And the reason why is that that's the first time they bothered to look at our scriptures to realize that there's a contradiction. But certainly not at the time of Muhammad, and certainly not before Muhammad, do we have any reference to a corruption. So then the question is, well, maybe it happened after Muhammad. If they go that route, then say, well, goodness sakes, come and let me show you all the manuscripts we have available to us today. We've got over 230 either full or partial documents of the New Testament alone from before the 6th century. Some of them, we, I love to do that in London because we can take them right down to the Ridback Gallery there in the British Library. And you can see the Sinaiticus, the Alexandrinus, you can see the Peshta there. There is the entire New Testament from the 4th century, the entire Bible from the 5th century. It's terrific to be able to take them through there and say, listen... If you look at this, you will see it is exactly the same as what we have in our scripture today, except for 40 verses. Those 40 verses we can do without if we don't need them. But we can reproduce the entire New Testament just from the early church fathers' quotations. 36,000 of them that predate the 4th century. And if you put them all together in chronological order, you can reproduce the entire 27 books of the New Testament except for 11 verses. So if we had corrupted it after Muhammad, what are you going to do with all those quotations? That means we have to go and change every 36,000 of them. Actually, we've now been able to find 86,000 that go up uh, as that precede, pre, pre, predate the 11th century, the time that Ibn Hazm finally came up with the idea that maybe we've corrupted it. But more than that, we've got 15,000 uh, uh, references or New Testaments that come in 11 different languages. What are you going to do with all those? Change them in all 11 languages? Can you imagine what we'd have to do? We'd have to do it before the 11th century. Can you see the enormity of the task that they're saying? So certainly, it's amazing if when they make these statements and they cannot source it, they cannot back it up. How does the Quran look when it's subject to a similar level of textual criticism? You weren't here yesterday, were you? <laughs> I did a whole hour and a half on that, deconstructing the Quran. It is horrible. And this is the great thing about it. It's such a good debate that we have. And I go on university campus and I, I have debates with this, and they don't ask me back a second time. Because that is, that is one area that they will not talk about. They have a, they're having a very difficult time with their own manuscripts. Now, they will try to argue it on the internet, yes. And there's been a good discussion going on the internet right now. Saifula, isn't that the good place? Oh, uh, yes, the Islamic Awareness website. Out of a Cambridge. That's one of the few areas where they're actually trying to get through this. And much of it is character assassination of the sources, looking at the people who are coming up and doing the research. There are some good, uh, some good material coming out, but by and large, rule of thumb is, when you look at the manuscripts, the Islamic manuscripts, for the first hundred years, we don't have anything at all uh, from the first 7th century up until the mid-8th century, there's only one manuscript that, that's, that's, uh, that can be dated to the early 8th century, and that has been uh, now researched by German scholars, Gerd Prynne and Dr. von Bothmer in Saarbrücken, in Saarland University, and that manuscript has over a 1,000 manuscript variants from the Quran they have in their hand today. Entire surahs are missing, 
and then they're suddenly interposed on another page where they don't belong in a completely different script, a much later what we call Abbasid script, though the earlier material is written in Hijazi script, proving that the Quran is evolving as it goes. So what we're finding out that the earliest Qurans that they claim, even the two earliest that they claim to be 7th century manuscripts, we've been able to date to the 9th century, without even doing any forensic evidence, just by looking at the script, just by looking at the medallions that are there, the pagination. Even the elongation with the lines, we can pretty much date them to the early 9th century. So they've got a real problem with their manuscripts. So we're asking, the Quran that you have in your hand today, that you consider to be a Uthmanic recension, as they claim this one is, it's been canonized in 1924 by Al-Azhar as an Uthmanic recension, what manuscript is it derived from? Certainly not the earliest manuscript, it doesn't agree with them. Now you can see, they have a lot of homework yet to do. They're not going to do it, we're going to do it for them. But it's because we are doing this that we can make this claim and we can be so confident. And that's why I don't mind if they do ask me this publicly. I'll go right back and throw it right back in their laps and say, listen, you've got a great problem. You, let's talk about how your Quran was put together. Let's see what Buhari, you, you trust Buhari, let's see what Buhari says, how this Quran was put together. And then things he claims, you, are never, you would never admit. But he is talking from the ninth century. He's much closer to the event. And he is by far your most authoritative scholar on the compilation of the Quran. He is sahih, which means there's no error in what he says. The claims you're making, Buhari would never claim. He would never make the, make the claim you're making, that there has been no changes, that it's perfect, that it's, it can be traced back 1,400 years. He would never make that claim. Be careful. If you're going to start attacking the Bible, we'll use the same in reverse. Now, I don't mind doing it in Europe. I won't do this in Saudi Arabia, obviously. But here, any of you can use these arguments. They're very good to use. They're very good to use. And we need to start doing it, yes. Okay? Um, did you want to say anything more about yeah, script? Well, the other one I was going to say I use on script shit, which you, you heard me do down in the corner, is we've, we've, said, we've said earlier, we were saying earlier on today, that rhetoric is quite important, the way you say things. And uh, one of the ones I've used on the scriptural corruption thing, you can go down Jay's line and learn the amount of script numbers and statistics. And I, I, I'm not like terrible at getting figures, but I never remember them. And last year, a friend of mine evolved this one, which I think we all recognize this, which worked really, really well for the majority of Muslims. I'm going to chop it down very quickly. But because for most Muslims, the, the book is very important. Quran came down to the book label because every previous prophet had a book, and all the previous books have been corrupted apart from the Quran. So I, I go, it's not like a crowd, I can go along these lines. I say, say, if I get this right, you're, you're saying to me that um, Allah gives a book to Adam, and Adam lost it and it got corrupted. Enoch got a book, and that kind of got corrupted. Moses, he gets a book, and that's corrupted. The Jews corrupted it. We got the odd bit in the, in the New Testament. David, he got a book, lost it. We got it from the Psalms. Jesus, he gets a book. That, that's gone missing as well. And then finally, Allah sends down the Quran to Muhammad and says, this is the final version. What kind of incompetent deity are you actually following? <laughs> the best part of two or three thousand years to actually get on the stage in the right place and give themselves their fingerprints all over. This is not a kind of God I want to, would want to trust my eternal destiny to. Are you sure this hasn't been corrupted? And then you can start throwing out the kind of problems that Jay goes. You know, well, it, may, it actually looks like the evidence points to the fact that Allah has stuffed up again, actually. Um, and with a the crowd, they will see very quickly seriously, if you, you want to hold to a high view of the sovereignty of God, which Muslims do, a very high view of the sovereignty of God, you have a problem if you then wish to say that actually God has allowed human beings to stuff up and stuff up and it's taken this long to get a revelation that's a, a supposedly intact and yet still has problems. Rhetorically, that's one of the most powerful stoppers I've come on that line. Because most Muslims at that point will say, oh, and the next thing is they go, why don't we just compare our scripts to where they are? I will not attack your Quran any further if you don't attack my Bible any further. In there you go. Well. Okay, we're almost out now. Andy, why are you still up there? Where does Jesus say, I am God? How do you answer that one? <laughs> That's a wicked little rhetorical trick. Give me that one. I'll um, take it if you don't. The very, very quick way I would deal with that um, would be to say something like, like you said, it's the talk of the Muslim doctrine of the oneness of God um, is not found in the Quran. Equally, you've already, you've already talked about the corruption of the Bible. If you say to a Muslim, where in the Quran did it say the phrase, the Bible has been corrupted? The answer is it isn't. And so what I tend to say to Muslims is I say, well, Jesus doesn't say anywhere directly, I am God in those words, but then he doesn't say, I am not God. What we need to do is look at what Jesus actually did say in its context. And that's quite a complicated one. There are places I would um, go to. John 8, 58 is quite a good one. Before Yahweh. Abraham was, I am. One of the, the, the biggest thing I would warn people against on this one, if this comes up, is you've got to be so careful because we are, there's a real danger of leaping into pre-texting at this point. Um, and it, this is a complicated area. You know, theologians spend their whole life writing books on how in the Jewish context Jesus is doing stuff to God. Um, I, I was the main thing I would want to try and do is broaden the question out. But yeah, John eight fifty eight is a good one. Luke 
Um, is it Luke 11, 22 or Luke 10, 10, 10? I think it's Luke 10, 22 is a really, really good one. Because so, 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 some sort of Christians get a bit jumpy about John because he draws so much of our Christology on there. But, but Luke 10, 22 is the one where Jesus says, um, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So we can also show that he's almost slightly clever Muslim skeptic, but actually the high Christology that we affirm is not just found in John, it's found in the synoptics okay. as well. And then you can trace that through into later interest. There's a, we we're almost out of time. There's an awful lot of subsidiary questions that also follow along that. Why does Jesus say, I don't know the end of times, so only God does? Why do you say, I'm good, only God is good? These seem to show that Jesus is inferior to God the Father. How could, if God is inferior, one is inferior to the other, how could there be both being the Godhead? There's, these are a lot of ones that come out. Let's just finish off with this one, did not die, God, uh, Christ died on the cross. And that really is pivotal because that's right at the heart of our message. Uh, if you go to Surah 4, Ayah 157, uh, it stipulates very clearly that they thought they crucified him, but they crucified him not. Another was given his image. So the crucifixion did take place, according to the Quran. But it wasn't Jesus was on the cross. He was taken up to be with God, and he will come again on a second coming, and he will come and live for 43 years on earth, and he will destroy all the crosses and all the pigs. And then he'll marry and have three children, and then he will die properly. But that's the second coming. What they believe is someone else died on the cross. Obviously, if you're going to t go down that line, as William Craig said yesterday or the day before, you still got an empty tomb. You've got to deal with that. Even if you don't believe that was Jesus on the cross, what happened to that body? But the real problem is if there's even an internal contradiction built into the Quran. In Surah 19, Ayah 33, Jesus refers to himself and he says, Blessed on me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I rise again. There it is in chapter 19. So that seems to contradict Surah 4 157. You've got an internal contradiction. In uh, Surah 3, Ayah 55, it refers to the fact that God caused Jesus to die before he took him up. Now, the newer translations, the uh, Yusuf Ali, do not put that cause him to die first. They've just excised that out of the, out of the English text. You need to go back to Arbury or Rodman, the better translations. But with the one on Jesus claiming to die, to be born, die, and rise again, if you have any problem trying to convince him that, that's, that it's not a future tense there, go back to verse 15, which says the exact same thing for John the Baptist. Blessed me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I rise again. Word for word the same as Jesus. And we do know that John died, did not, was not taken up. So those are, are internal contradictions. The best way to, ref to respond to that that is, not only do you have this internal contradiction, what are you going to do with the eyewitness accounts? And that's what uh, William did uh, the other night. There's just such a plethora of eyewitness accounts. Not only the Gospels themselves, but even the hostile witnesses admit to the fact that Jesus died. Tacitus mentions it. Josephus mentions it. Thallus mentions that the day went, that the, the earth shook and the day went dark on the day that he died. So you can see, these are hostile witnesses. These are not even witnesses that we would need to have. The fact that they're outside the Christian tradition and they admit the fact that Jesus died, that is not in doubt. And as Andy always says, ask any Western or any scholar today, if you want to find out about the crucifixion of Jesus, you do not go to the Quran, you go to the Bible. Because it's closer to the event. Three eyewitnesses who were there wrote about it. The other one got it from the eyewitnesses. We'll go with eyewitness, event, uh, eyewitness, eyewitness William account. William Craig made an interesting point the, the other day in conversation at dinner, which was he'd done some debates with um, Shabir Ali, who was the leading kind of Muslim apologist worldwide, I mean, based in Canada. And they, cut, they did a series of four, four or five debates a couple of years ago. And, they, and one of them was on this whole issue. And um, William said, which is fascinating, he was completely wrong with it because they got this whole issue. And Shabir comes out with this theory that Jesus was put on the cross, um, almost, almost died, but God kept him alive just. And then in the tomb, he gets zapped up to heaven. And, um, and then it was visions that appeared to the disciples to convince them of the risen Jesus. So he manages to draw on the spoon theory, the hallucinations theory, and have a Jesus who is crucified, contrary to the Quran. And I think what we, we were saying in conversation is that William was saying, talking to him afterwards, he recognises that Shabir is having real trouble with this. I think any Muslim who has actually examined the evidence has real problems. The Quran is internally in co in contradictory. The evidence for the death of Jesus, we're not talking about the resurrection now, we're talking about the death, is so overwhelming. Um, it's, it's, it's really encouraging that the top apologists like Professor Apple sort of go, mm, there's a problem, can we come and see what's going on? Okay, we need to stop there. It's 5.30. Thanks for your time. Do fill out the uh, questionnaire here before you, uh, I'll just do, let you do that. I'll pass out one final uh, workshop evaluation. You can fill that out. I really appreciate it.